Hi, Phil Aston here from Now Spinning Magazine with another video that touches on the world of Deep Purple, one of my favourite bands. And this is a look back uh, and a kind of a beginner's guide to Mark I Deep Purple, but also my story and journey to Deep Purple Mark I because I find that's the best way of doing these things and as usual this is completely non-scripted and I might actually do a spin-off video if I feel this one is going on for too long especially when we look at some of the things you can buy that brings together the world of Mark I Deep Purple. I became a Deep Purple fan as many of you know from the album Deep Purple in Rock because I heard Machine Head first but went to the shop to buy it but couldn't find it, so bought in rock instead. So it was about 1972, 73, I think it was. I didn't know anything about Deep Purple prior to In Rock. I didn't know another Deep Purple existed before that. So I just went back to In Rock and ventured forwards and followed them. It was actually around the mid 70s when I started to realise that they had been doing something prior to that. I'd heard then of the concerto of a group and orchestra, which will be a separate video. And then I started to get a few kind of like compilation albums. And one of them, which I got when I was at school, was this one called Mark One and Mark Two, which is from Germany. There's different versions of this um, inside. It's all in German with the tracks sorry with the albums across the bottom, across the bottom, <clears throat> sorry for the pun there, and obviously it introduced me to a lot of music that I didn't even know was Deep Purple, Hush, you know, Rick Mandrake Root, Why Didn't Rosemary, Hey Joe, and Side 2, Ring That Neck, Emeretta, Help, Chasing Shadows, all different but sounding very different to the deep purple that I loved and different enough for me to think I don't really want to explore that at the moment. That's where I was. So my next kind of connection to Deep Purple Mark I was this, this uh, Harvest Heritage series, um, which, which was a way of collecting A's and B sides from various bands on the Harvest label. And the Deep Purple one came out um, collecting, obviously side two was Mark II, and side one was Mark One. Um, I bought it for the Mark Two stuff because, strangely, it might seem, imagine that back then, if you hadn't bought Black Knight as a single, um, it wasn't on in rock. Um, and same as Strange Kind of Woman, um, if you hadn't got the singles and the B sides, they weren't on anything really back then. So it was the only compilations like this was the only way to get hold of those original singles. You can't imagine that now, can you? But that's what it was like. There were two versions of this that look exactly the same, except one isn't, um, because one was actually on purple vinyl. But it wasn't advertised as being on purple vinyl, so no one really knew. So it was complete fluke or accident if you managed to get one, and that's exactly how I ended up with a purple vinyl one, because I saw one in a record fair and picked it up, because I was thinking of selling my other one, thinking, why do I need this during the great 90s call of vinyl? And and I just changed my mind about selling this and ended up with two. There you go. <clears throat> the other ones were, I bought this one from Germany called Deep Purple Collection. And this features Mark III on the front. But all the tracks are actually from Mark I. So that's another one. And then, of course, the, one of the main ones for making me want to go down the Mark I route was 24 karat purple. Why? Because it didn't have any Mark I on it, did it? It didn't. But it had this mysterious album at the bottom called Purple Passages, USA Import. So for quite a long time, I did my best to try and find that. And all the ones I found, because there'd been several, looked like this, which has been a subject of a separate video. They always had this ring wear on them. And I thought that was part of the design. And it's not. <laughs> um, actually, it was possible to find some that were absolutely perfect. Now, what made this special was it was all Mark I. And it also featured tracks that weren't available 
Emoretta, for instance, was a studio tra- a single that wasn't on any of the Mark I albums. So I've also got this as a Japanese version as well now. Where I'm going with all of this is that I didn't actually own any of the Mark I albums at this point. And this goes all the way through. Are you ready? Consider I'm such a big, deep purple fan. It's 1993. Yeah. I went to see them um, on tour. The Battle Rage is on tour. And I was realizing as I started a new job and um, I'd got, I'd become a dad, how much Deep Purple meant to me. And I was desperate then to buy everything. This is a CD age. So there were like Deep Purple had lots of live stuff coming out that hadn't been released before. Um, So there were lots of things coming out. This is around the time also that the Live in Japan, Made in Japan came out as a a complete set, as a 3D set. So I was thinking, you know, I just became more and more kind of like passionate about Deep Purple and all the Deep Purple family and all the offshoots. And I thought, Phil, you don't actually have the Mark I stuff in on its own each album individually there's a whole new seam of stuff to mine there surely I thought, well I've got some of the tracks but I maybe you're right so it began and the first one I bought was Shades of Deep Purple this is the original CD from I think one that came out with that and I think then I got the Deep Purple the third one because it was four pounds and you could buy a CD for four quid in the early 90s was a revelation because they were all about 17, 18 quid. Um, And obviously I was hearing music for the first time. This is important to me and to you, perhaps for those of you um, Deep Purple fans who have been around longer than me. I had no idea really that Mandrake Root featured a section that was actually in space trucking from Main Japan, uh, the live version that all of those things, they weren't all made up on the spot. They were parts of other stuff. So it was a revelation in knowing that Mandrake Root had been incorporated into space trucking. So Mark One's instrument, instrumentational prowess was there right from the beginning, going into Mark Two and beyond, obviously into uh, Mark Three as well and beyond, and beyond that. Where did I go after that? After that, again, there was things like, this is a probably an advisory section. Inglewood, live in California, Perp 2004, eight, October the 18th, 1968. This came out on the Sonic Zoom label. This is the only, I believe, live version of a Mark I Deep Purple performance. It's a bootleg. Um, it, it came with a little booklet, a little bit of history behind it, but it's not... It's not going to sound wonderful, but historically, because they were supporting Cream, can you imagine that? They were supporting Cream and part of their farewell stuff, that here was Deep Purple Mark I live. But I can't say I play that very often. Then we had Deep Purple, the early years. I'm going to come in a minute to what I think about each album. Deep Purple, the early years, which then had Shades of Deep Purple, Book of Talisman, and the third album with remixes, actual remixes. This is a great compilation. And that, to me, satisfied my needs for a long time. And then each of the albums came out as remastered with extra tracks, um, with some extra tracks on as well. The booklets in these were replicated, and it was hard to read from one to the other to work out where the new text started and where the old text ended. And then finally... The mother load for most people into Mark One, and I'll do a separate unboxing of this because I don't want this to be too long. Is this? This is called Hard Road, the Mark One studio recordings from 1968 to 1969, and it features Shades of Deep Purple in mono, Shades of Deep Purple in stereo, Book of Talisman in mono, um, Book of Talisman in stereo, and and also Deep Purple the original album with tons of. Um, Bonus tracks, which have been sprinkled over the other things you've just seen. The the albums inside are in little gatefold sleeves, depending on whether it's mono or stereo. I think it might be out of print now, but this has everything that you need from a CD. But I'll do a, a separate unboxing video on that 
set. So what are my thoughts now on the three albums themselves? This isn't an original um, Shades of Deep Purple vinyl set. It's a repressing from Farlophone, um, but it's you know all done to look like that. It's very much vanilla fudge. And as I've just read out that period there that from that box set it's from 1968 to 1969, think about that. Deep Purple, Mark One, basically was is about a year, really. And the way they look on that, they look like this is the 60s, isn't it? But remember, this is 1968. Within two years, it's in rock. It's it's amazing. And the address, Hush, this is John Lord's band. This is John Lord in running Deep Purple at this stage. Hush, the keyboard, the Hammond solo on that. One More Rainy Days, the Beatles, isn't it? Prelude, Happiness, I'm So Glad, which, of course, Cream had done. Everyone did that, didn't they? Mandrake Root, the first sign of we're moving into a totally different world and aspects of Mandrake Root were going to be on space trucking on mainly Japan. And were, of course, part of the life set. Help by the Beatles, but slow down like Vanilla Fudge would do to turn it into an absolutely magical, almost prog experience. Love Help Me, and then a slowed down version of Hey Joe, which had only recently been made famous by, of course, Jimi Hendrix. The next one, is probably was an album I did hear at school. I bought it from the school library um, when they were when, when me and my friend were trying to work out, you know, what we could listen to it to educate ourselves to listen to more rock based music. And neither of us liked it. It was so different to in rock, fireball, man Japan, burn. Listen, learn, read on, which is a, obviously an original. But ring that neck, of course. It feels the guitar playing the solo on ring that was always felt a little bit awkward as if Blackmore's still trying to work out how to be Richie Blackmore to think that only literally 18 months away from this he's going to play in guitar solos like a child in time Kentucky Woman for Neil Diamond again to my ears back then it was like Ugh. exposition we can work it out another Beatles song arranged like Vanilla Fudge Shield I like that one Anthem and River Deep Mountain High, another kind of vanilla fudge kind of flavoured cover version. Came in a great gatefold sleeve with the band looking absolutely as cool as you could possibly be. All hanging around the piano on the back um, because John Lord was in charge of Deep Purple. He was the band leader. And there's, there's also some great string arrangements on here as well. But Deep Purple, the bridge between Mark One and Mark Two is this one, Deep Purple, by Deep Purple. All they needed was a track on it called Deep Purple. And then they would have been like Black Sabbath from the album Black Sabbath, um, from the band Black Sabbath. Um, this had a gatefold sleeve with some tails behind the kind of the tracks as well. But this really was more about what the band were really. Chasing Shadows was a great track, Blind, Lalina, Fault Line, The Painter, and most importantly, Why Didn't Rosemary? Because this blues, 12-bar blues shuffle was probably the closest we got to realising that Richie Blackmore was coming forwards to be the star of the band with Pace and Lord. And then John Lord's first masterpiece, April. This is his kind of embryonic, template that inspired the management to go oh why don't we book Royal Albert Hall and tell Mr Lord could you write a concerto for a group and an orchestra just in about eight weeks time so April was an orchestral kind of birth of where John Lord would take his career not just here but beyond into masterpieces like the Durham Concerto etc and pictured within this has always been my favourite Mark One Deep Purple album. I think because of the versatility of it and the fact that they're on the verge of coming forwards. Now, one of the things I want to say at this point, 
So you can, those of you modern music fans, um, whoever you are, to understand that Shades of Deep Purple was recorded in May 11th to 13th, 1968. Um, I think it was, it was released in September 1968. Okay, keep that in your mind. So it was released in September 1968. Book of Atalazin, okay, it was recorded in August 1968. So that was recorded a month before Shades was released. It was, re it was released in July 1969. It had already been released in October 1968. So it came out in America a lot earlier, but it came out in July 1969. Now, that's Book of Atalazin. Now, remember, Concerto for Group and Orchestra is recorded in September 1969. You see where I'm going with this? That Mark 1 and Mark 2 are almost sitting next to each other on the bus. And then Deep Purple, the third one, is recorded in March 1969. And it's released in November 1969. So September 68, Shades comes out. July 69, the second one comes out. And merely months later, the third one comes out. And remember that Concerto comes out roughly at the same time. So the third Mark I album is coming out while Mark II are already recording and getting ready for In Rock. I think, aside from Uriah Heap recording about six albums in two years, I don't think there's anything like it with such a condensed amount of music being recorded in literally over 12 months. Now bands will say, we've got another album coming out, our first album for 10 years. It was so different back then. But what really sums up this period of Deep Purple is John Lord, the Hammond organ, the arrangements, the orchestral side, as Blackmore starts, is refining his craft behind the scenes. Of course, the concerto and group and orchestra later on in life is a success. And people look back at it now as being like, the explosion that started orchestral symphonic rock. But then, of course, it was seen as an experiment that worked or didn't it. But Richie had no time for it at all. When people were saying, where's the orchestra when they played at even the small venues, he said the next album is going to be a rock album, it's going to be guitar orientated, and that's it. And then Richie became the front lead leader of the band Deep Purple. Of course, the, that trio of Pace, Lord and Blackmore was always seen as this on the same level, but Blackmore was the leader. Lord took a back seat. There was no kind of string arrangements or long elongated kind of orchestral pieces beyond this album and that track, April. So they're all worth listening to. They're all part of the Deep Purple story. You now have the the ability to listen to these things whenever you want. It took me the best part of two decades to immerse myself into music that I could have listened to so much earlier, but because of the expense of things and knowing where to start, it took me a lot longer. Apart from the odd tracks I had on those compilations, it took me till the early 90s to actually go and get all these albums on vinyl. In fact, when was the last one I got? I think this one I bought from... This is an original on Harvest, the third one. I got this from Dartmouth, actually, from a second-hand shop probably about 10 years ago. But I've got them all on CD. So I would hunt down, the, if you're a CD fan, try and find this, um, the box set which brings all the tracks to get all the albums together in little gatefold sleeves, and it's superb. If you can't find that, then try and buy the albums individually, or if you can't find that find the early years which is fantastic on vinyl you can probably get them all now on on re-released and remastered vinyl there isn't really any compilations that i would recommend uh, unless you really want to find purple passages from america but you'll it's hard to find one that hasn't been knackered and i suppose maybe the only other one that's really worth it is the not really worth it but a, 
kind of conversation piece is Mark 1 and Mark 2, and that's mainly because of my attachment to it, because it was the only one in the 70s that had Mark 1 on it. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for all of your support and kind messages. It means such a lot to me. So take care, all of you. Remember, music is the healer and the doctor. Keep spinning those discs, and I'll see you all very, very soon.